The conversation around the minimum wage has dragged on for quite a while now, as organized labor and the federal government are yet to agree on a figure. Chairman of the Tripartite Committee on National Minimum Wage, Buka Goniaji, has asked labor to reconsider the amount it demanded as minimum wage, citing the prevailing economic situation in the country. The labor in a swift reaction accused the Tripartite Committee chairman of lacking knowledge of the hardship and suffering workers and other Nigerians were going through. Organized labor is demanding 250,000 Naira as minimum wage per month. But the federal government and organized private sector have offered 62,000 Naira per month. Joining us now on this show to continue the conversation around the minimum wage and possible ways to resolve the issue is Adewale Smart Uyerindi, Director General, Nigerian Employers Consultative Association, NECA. Good morning, Mr. Smart Uyerindi, and thank you for joining us. Good morning, and thanks for having us also. Well, quickly, um, Buka Goniaji, the chairman of the Tripartite Committee, says organized labor is not paying attention to economic realities, and particularly all the efforts that the federal government has made uh, to uh, make things easier for the Nigerian worker. CNG vehicles, transportation allowances, 25,000 Naira, 15 million uh, households, uh, uh, 100 billion to procure uh, vehicles, and so on and so forth. The labor says uh, it is the government that is being unrealistic about the hardship that the people of Nigeria are facing. Well, you are the DG of uh, NECA. Now, organized private sector and the federal government, they are on the same side. So who among all these, uh, you know, uh, three-way uh, consultation uh, moves is being unrealistic? What is real? What is unrealistic in your view? Thank you very much once again. I, I think first I will say uh, the committee, the Tripartite Committee has spent quite a long time discussing, engaging, and consulting before we arrived at the figures that we eventually came up with. Um, 62,000 for the private sector, 62,000 by federal government, and then Labour came up with them. Or the last, last lap came up with the 250,000 Naira figure. Now, are those three figures, are they, are they justified within the context of the realities of each party? I would say yes. Now, we now have to subject those figures to a different dynamics that is beyond all of us, which is probably one of them, the economic context, the economic dynamics. Because everything basically rests on the economy. Can the economy carry it? Can organized businesses, as it currently constitutes, can it carry it? Those are parameters that we can't run away from. Unfortunately for us, you know, the ILO convention just finished uh, about a few days ago. And we also had the privilege of speaking to a senior, senior analyst, a senior special analyst in the, in the International Labour Organization that deals with wage remuneration at the global level. And we had this holistic conversation about what exactly is happening globally, how are these issues, how are they normally resolved, which also enriched the conversation that we'll be having subsequently. So coming to the issue of the figures, now, the reality for us is this, as organized private sector. I will not want to delve into the realities of government. I will not want to delve into the 250 realities of, of, of organized labor. But the reality for the organized private sector, because ability to pay is a fundamental part of that issue that we have to take into consideration. Enterprise sustainability is also a fundamental part of those parameters that we have to take into consideration. The state of the economy is also a fundamental part of that parameter, and then the needs of workers is also a fundamental part of that conversation. And for me, it's this, and for the organized private sector, is this. What should be our objective now that the economy is standing on one leg, as some have said? Do we pay a wage that is unsustainable? Do we pay a wage that will also fast track 
the current challenge of unemployment rate. Those are the critical conversations that we need to have. All of us cannot play, play the ostrich and, and, and act as if people, are, our brothers and sisters, are not losing their jobs. We cannot pay, play the ostrich and behave as if companies are not closing down or reducing their capacity utilization. We cannot play the ostrich. And for us in the private sector, the reality is this. With the current reality that we face, the current challenges that we face, we feel 22,000, 22, we painfully, and I must, I must emphasize that, the team of the organized private sector painfully agreed to that 62,000 based on certain conditions that government will also take into account. So it is not a, it, it is not a, it is not as if the private sector is, is, um, is Shylock, is only driven by profit, no. There are so many parameters that we have to consider before we say it's for the private sector, a cutting point is 62,000. And in the process now, the tripartite committee has completed this work. And it's very important that Nigerians, all of us, we stop sensationalizing the issue. The tripartite committee has completed its work. The tripartite committee was set up under Convention 131 of the ILO, which specifies the framework for arriving at this conversation. And we have gone through that framework with the guidance of the ILO, and the committee has made a recommendation to the, to the president himself. As it was done in 2019, as it was done in years before, we make a recommendation to the president, who will now either take your recommendation or looking at the, his own reality, the, the realities of government, now approve a figure that will be passed to the National Assembly for legislative action. It is out of the hands of the tripartite now. So anybody that is still making, um, making issues or making, um, raising contentious comments, for us, the matter is now with the, with the president who has the sole responsibility, the constitutional responsibility to announce a figure that will, be, that will not only, be, uh, only be, 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 that will not only promote economic development, and that will also meet to a, to a large extent the needs of everybody, all stakeholders. All right. All right, thank you so much, and, and good to see you, Mr. Smato Irinde. Just to ask, uh, there are a number of other scenarios that have been pushed forward. Uh, Dr. Muda Yusuf, even the governor of Lagos State, had talked about perhaps exploring a different uh, wage or minimum wage for different tiers of government based on the capacity to pay, because that's something that you've talked about a number of times that it's unfair to ask, for instance, people who work with the federal government, people who work with state government, or who work with, you know, in, in private sectors to get the same amount of money or pay the same amount of money because of capacity to pay. What's your take on this particular proposition? Should we perhaps explore that as opposed to a uniform minimum wage across boards? Now, there are two contexts to that issue. First, labor is currently on the exclusive list. That is, is handled at the national level. So all issues related to labor is, is within the realm, within the domain of the federal government. That creates a different dynamics. If it's in the concurrent list now, then we can say each state will handle their, their, their minimum wage. Now, the fear of stakeholders is this. You know, even while we were still at the national minimum wage committee level, while we were still consulting and engaging a state governor announced that their own minimum wage now is 30,000. Meanwhile, five years ago, it was agreed that it was 30,000. But in 2024, a state governor announced that their own minimum wage is now 30,000, just the way Edo announced a figure, and I think the government announced a figure. Now, the challenge is this. If you leave it at the state level, the capacity or ability or the potential to protect the most vulnerable worker, which the minimum wage is supposed to protect, that capacity and that ability will be seriously compromised. And you have different subnationals coming up with different ridiculous figures. So what is done is this, that the minimum wage, and that is why, where the misconception has been, and that is where some stakeholders have actually modeled up the narration and created a, 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 big, of, a big mess in the minds of so, so many others. The minimum wage is the least wage below which nobody must pay. It is not a salary increase. It is not a general salary award. It is not a wage award. It is the minimum for the most vulnerable. 
the minimum that your driver should not collect, the minimum below which your driver should not take, the minimum below which a carpenter most likely should not take, it is the minimum below which nobody should be paid. And it is, for now, within the context of our development, I think the national minimum wage still remains relevant so that no state governor, no employer in the private sector, nobody except those that are exempted should pay below. So for now, within the context of where we are, we believe strongly that the national minimum wage, there should be a national, that any subnational can pay ahead of it. That is how it's done in the US. That is how it's done in South Africa. I said we had a robust conversation with this senior, senior, senior specialist for wage remuneration in the ILO. And I think that is what is applicable, and that is one of the things we can copy from. So for now, we think a national minimum wage that everybody below which you cannot pay should suffice. It reduces the ability for any governor, any private sector employer to manipulate a figure below that, below that rate. Okay. Do all your members pay the pre-existing minimum wage? That's the first question. Secondly, let's talk about market realities in tandem with this 62,000. If you are not paying workers in tandem with market reality, because you were mentioning America, but what you also forgot to see is that it was the, it was the laborers themselves in America, let me use that word, that set the new minimum wage per hour after COVID. And what they did was that they put the companies in high jump. They were not available to work. Companies started raising rates state by state for themselves. So if you're not paying these workers in tandem with current realities, which Guardian newspaper did a study recently and they said, to pay a wage that is concerned with market reality, so that at least they can have good, small good food, the ideal wage is 104,000. How do you want to foster productivity if you don't pay them in consonance with market reality? I understand your plight, I understand your challenges. Don't get me wrong. Business is tough. That's the question. Now, for the first question of are all private sector organizations paying the subsisting 30,000 national minimum wage? I can say not all private sector organizations are paying it. And I'll give you, I'll, 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 I'll give you the, the dynamics of that. Now, the national minimum wage is a law. And it would be preposterous for me to sit here and say all private sector organizations are actually paying. Now, in the Act, in the Act of 2019, there are penalties and there are enforcement conditions. For like every other society that you say um, armed robbery is a crime, but you still find people stealing. A murder is a crime, you still find people killing. So it is not unrealistic that there are employers that are not paying the current minimum wage. And I must also say this, um, say it live, on, on, live, online, that what we preach is responsible enterprises. So for enterprises that are not paying the 30,000 30, as of when it was enacted, it is the role of the enforcement agencies, those that should enforce, that are supposed to take it up. You know, what I'm to you that during the committee meetings, you know, the, the National Salaries and Income and Wages Commission did an analysis of the compliance level. In the private sector, it was about 60-70%, uh, about 60-70%. 60, in the public sector, they gave the figure. So it is not unlikely you find employers that are still trying to game the system. And that is why there are enforcement clauses, enforcement clauses and penalties also in the Act. So it's the role of the agencies that are supposed to enforce to do the work of enforcement. As I said, you always find employers that will want to game the system. It's, it happens everywhere. Now, the second question to the issue of market reality. You know, it depends on where you are looking at it from. Market reality is subjective. It's subjective to the extent of the ability of the business owner to pay it. You can't look at market reality from the perspective of consumption. You must look at market reality from the perspective of production also. So they go pari passu. They go hand in hand. And the context you probably mentioned, we are looking at the issue of living wage, you know, living wage to meet your needs. And you also draw up the issue of productivity. For us, we've, we said minimum wage, 62,000. It's more like a show-up wage. 
In this whole conversation, we've not dragged in the issue of, of productivity. For 62,000, then what is the employee being bringing on the table? Those are the real conversations that we should have. It's our firm belief that two things, among many others, that would drive, that should drive wages up, is one, is productivity. So what are they bringing One, on it the is table? skill. What, and what are they bringing? Are you comfortable? No. Hang, hang on, Misa. Are you comfortable with what the Nigerian employee bringing on the table? Are they skillful? Are they productive or less productive? Are you happy about them? Or is it because you don't have a choice, that's why you employ them? Now, for issue of like uh, whether you like them or whether you, whether you appreciate what, what they bring on the table, that is also a very subjective question. Do we appreciate the contribution of organ organized labor to national productivity? Absolutely. Does the private sector appreciate the contribution of labor to the growth of the private sector? Absolutely we do. But at a point, you get to a point where you look at your survival. Because without enterprise sustainability, we won't even be talking of jobs. Those are the big realities. And that, those are the things that the private sector is taking no, into no, consideration. No, no. That rather than increase salaries or increase wages to a level that labor is demanding and face the consequences of job losses, we would rather stay within the realm of what is affordable for now and protect jobs and keep jobs and also keep our ability to create jobs. Those are the big fundamental issues that we need to, uh, to, to, to address. Mr. Yonede, yes, productivity is very important. As I was quoting uh, uh, Mr. Babatunde Raju Fashola yesterday, uh, where he made the point that we must draw a proper distinction between salaries and wages and what will amount to social security. And he said all of that in the context of productivity, or to use your expression, what uh, the worker brings to the table. You quoted the National Minimum Wage Act of uh, 2019. After you had said, I wanted to take you up on that, that, oh, it's a minimum that must be paid, even to drivers, even to uh, house assistants and all that. And I want to draw your attention to that same act that you quoted. Section 3 of that act says, yes, any payment that is below the national minimum wage is void. The exemptions are stated, and I would like you to comment on that. In section 4, <coughs> and section 4 be, begins by saying, look, the uh, section 3 does not apply to the following categories. People who are involved, involved in uh, part-time appointments, <coughs> people who are in, involved in seasonal assignments, like agriculture, employment spaces where the total number of staff is not up to 25. The law is very clear on that. So if you are, uh, employ one person or two persons, under, to, under the figure 25, uh, the national minimum wage does not apply to you. Or if you are involved in uh, businesses that are governed by international regulations, like shipping, like aviation, I'd like you to comment on that because I hear a lot of labor leaders saying, oh, even if uh, you have uh, two people in your household, you must pay them a new national minimum wage. In the poor view of the law, you will not have broken any law. Now, and thank you for, for, for bringing, bringing that up. Now, for, for the private sector, you know, hardly will you find, you no, know, I won't speak within the realm of an individual that employs one driver, an individual that employs two drivers. Because within the context of this whole conversation, for every law, there are also provisions to safeguard the most, the most of the most vulnerable within the context of the economy. And that is why exceptions came up. In the 2019 Act, it says exception of organizations that are employing less than 25 persons. Now, that is a legal, a legal provision to protect certain individuals. But hardly will you find an organization, a business organization, except in the nano, nano, nano industries, the micro industries, and the, and the SMEs. In fact, the Nas National Policy on SMEs quoted, and I quote, it said, SMEs are organizations that are employing between one and 200 staff. And those are, those, are, those, are, those are exceptions. So for us, those exceptions stays. If you are employing less than 25 persons, those exceptions still stays that you are out of the context of that, of that realm. But for an organization 
that is employing over 25, then you are captured within the law. Because any organization that is employing less than 25, the spirit of that conversation then was that it is most likely that your turnover will not be as significant as possible to accommodate whatever conversation we are having in the context of the national minimum wage. So as your businesses, your business or your businesses grow beyond the 25, 25 employee realm, you naturally get captured within the context of, of what the legislation has said. So it is it's absolutely right that there are exceptions, and we push for that exemption. In fact, in the current negotiation, the current conversation that we have, the private sector push for more exemption, more instead of 25, we push for higher vigor. Because the MSME, they are basically the soul of this economy. And if we create a system or a structure that will compromise their existence, we are creating more social economic problems for ourselves. So that is the position that we hold, and we hold firm to those positions. All right, fair enough. Now, in the event, I know you've said that um, the ball is now in the court of the president. In the event that he announces a minimum wage or it's passed by law over 62,000 now, what would be the impact for members of your organization? Now, what you will have done is this. You, know, you, will have, you will have, the president will have, will have um, initiated a chain reaction. And I'll paint the figure to you. I'll paint the picture to you. All right. Now, if it is above what the private sector can pay. You've initiated a process where businesses will start looking at their current structure. Who do I keep? Who do I leave? A position that we don't, have to, we don't want to find ourselves. A position we don't want to get to of reviewing staff strength, um, exploring, further exploring the issue of automation. We don't want to get there because of the current, un, current unemployment rate. That is one of it. Because if that happens, then you've created another dynamics within the current within the issue of insecurity for yourselves. Now, the second perspective to it is this. You will have created a big problem for the, for the National Industrial Court because in part of the conditions in violations and penalties that an employee that is aggrieved can approach the National Industrial Court as an individual or as a group for them, for the Industrial Court, to advocate on the matter. Now, you will have created proliferation of cases at the National Industrial Court. Cases which might take one, two, three, four, five years to dispense with because of the quantum of those cases. So we'll have left, the president will have signed, but we'll have created a big problem for the judiciary, that's the National Industrial Court. We'll have created another dynamics of issue of unemployment rate. We'll have created so many dynamics that is beyond the conversation of the national minimum wage. And our position look, the president should look at it dispassionately, while the federal government, while the federal government will do the needful and address the issue of transportation, address the issue of food security, and address so many other issues of, of social, social security that are basically at the heart of this conversation. If transportation is working well, if there is food security, if the social economic condition of, of, of workers is, um, is, 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 is top notch or at the middle level, then the agitation, because we believe strongly Everybody, labor is responding to the, Nash, to the bigger picture of the economy and probably not to the real issue of the quantum of the national minimum wage. And we have urged the federal government to do what is needful as urgently as possible to address those, those macroeconomic issues that is at the heart of this conversation. Okay, but all the scenarios you painted before are the scenarios that are either to applicable. There are many cases in the industrial court as we speak. There are many backs and forth. There are many job losses. I mean, you can see for the manufacturing sector. So all the scenarios you are putting out there is not new. Are these scenarios more than the effect of the fact that because of poor remuneration, the workers are dying? They have dire situations to work. They are working under very, very sad and inhumane situations, which a lot of people are saying, you, the employers of labor, are not meeting them halfway through. You know, when you say they are working in dire and inhumane conditions, you are, you, are, you are invariably demonizing the private sector. You are, you are, you are creating 
a, a, a scenario that paints the private sector as, as the demon. Are they not which, working which, in which inhumane conditions? Right. Are they not working in inhumane conditions? No, the, is it all your members that are doing I, things I, I, right I, for the workers? Let's call it speed to speed. We are in this country together. That is generalization. You, 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 I didn't generalize. You, you, you are no. generalizing. No, you, you, didn't ask, you didn't hear my question. You are, you are, you are generalizing asked, this context. I, no, I didn't generalize. I said, is it all your members that are doing something right? If I said all your members are not doing something right, that's generalization. But I asked a rhetorical question. Is it all your members that are doing something right? That's not generalization. That's not generalization. So is everything right? Let's call it speed to speed. No, I, I, every, you know, you know, there, there is an adage in my in my in my in my village, or generally, if you if you permit me, he said, um, if the rope is not um, if the rope is not at peace, then it will be very difficult for the bed to perch comfortably on it. And I'll rope, I'll ride if here. the business, absolutely, Mr. Abbott, thank you very much. If the business is is on the precipice. Then it will, the natural consequence is that everybody associated with it, the investors, the, 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 the MD, the, the managers of the business, everybody associated with that business will probably not find it easy. You know, we, we can't continue to, to feed the, 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 the cost and then we are complaining about the effects. If the business is, is, is struggling to survive, is, is carrying a, a, a burdensome weight that, that the, the economy and so many other factors are placed on it. Then what ra rationalization will you, how do you rationalize if every other person has stayed with it, they are living fat? Th those are the real issues that we, we are beginning to face. And I said earlier, do we appreciate the conditions that Nigerian workers are currently going through? Absolutely we do. Do we appreciate the contributions of Nigerian workers to the growth of the economy and growth of, of the private sector? Absolutely we do. But you don't go overboard and create further problems for yourself only for the workers that you are trying to protect. Those are the real conversations that we should have. Well, uh, Mr. Yeri, they would like to thank you very much. But I'm interested in the book at your back there on your shelf, the uh, five sorrowful mysteries of. I can't. I can't read out the uh, other two lines. What's the title? Don't no, worry. We'll we send the title? one to you. We we'll send one to you. Uh, but what's the title? The other two lines. I, 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 I will have to check again. I will have to check again. Okay. Anyway, thank you very much, Mr. Adewale Smart Oyerinde, Director General of NECA. Thank you for joining us. <laughs>